Greetings, patrons, and welcome to this production of the Patreon-requested novel, Dragons of Autumn Twilight, by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. If you would like to assist helping Bearded Book Club grow, please recommend us to all your friends and ask them to subscribe to the channel if they like what, they do, what we do. Feel free to tell them about the YouTube channel membership as well as the extra perks you get for becoming a patron. So without further ado, let us continue. Chapter 4. The Open Door. Flight into Darkness. Raceland sat down on the hearth, rubbing his thin hands in the warmth of a small fire. His golden eyes seemed brighter than the flames as he stared intently at the blue crystal staff resting across the woman's lap. What do you think? asked Tannis. If she's a charlatan, she's a good one, Raceland commented thoughtfully. Worm, you dare to call the chieftain's daughter charlatan? The tall barbarian stepped toward Raceland, his dark brows contracted in a vicious scowl. Cameron made a low, rumbling sound in his throat and moved from the window to stand behind his brother. Riverwind, the woman laid her hand on the man's arm as he drew near her chair. Please, he meant no harm. It is right that they do not trust us. They do not know us. And we do not know them, the man growled. If I might examine it, Raceland said. Goldmoon nodded and held out the staff. The mage stretched out his long bony arm, his thin hands grasping for it eagerly. As Raceland touched the staff, however, there was a bright flash of blue light and a crackling sound. The mage jerked his hand back, crying out in pain and shock. Caraman jumped forward, but his brother stopped him. No, Caraman, Raceland whispered hoarsely, wringing his injured hand. The lady had nothing to do with that. The woman, indeed, was staring at the staff in amazement. What is it then? Tannis asked in exasperation. A staff that heals and injures at the same time? It merely knows its own. Raceland licked his lips, his eyes glittering. Watch. Caraman, take the staff. Not me, the warrior drew back as if from a snake. Take the staff, Raceland demanded. Reluctantly, Caraman stretched out a trembling hand. His arm twitched as his fingers came closer and closer. Closing his eyes and gritting his teeth in anticipation of pain, he touched the staff. Nothing happened. Caraman opened his eyes wide, startled. He gripped the staff, lifted it in his huge hands, and grinned. See there? Raceland gestured like an illusionist showing off a trick to the crowd. Only those of simple goodness, pure in heart, his sarcasm was biting, may touch the staff. It is truly a sacred staff of healing, blessed by some god. It is not magic. No magic object that I have ever heard about have healing powers. Hush, ordered Tasselhoff, who had taken Caraman's place by the window. The Theocrats' guards, he warned softly. No one spoke. Now they could all hear goblin footsteps flapping on the bridge walks that ran among the branches at the Valenwood trees. They're conducting a house-to-house -house search, Tannis whispered incredulously, listening to Fist banging on the neighboring door. The Seekers demand right of entry, croaked a voice. There was a pause, then the same voice said, No one home. Do we kick the door in? Nah, said the other voice. We better just report to the Theocrat. Let him kick the door down. Now if it was unlocked, that'd be different. We're allowed to enter then. Tannis looked at the door opposite him. He felt the hair rise on the back of his neck. He could have sworn that he had shut and bolted the door. Now it stood slightly open. The door, he whispered, Caraman. But the warrior had already moved over to stand behind the door, his back to the wall, his giant hands flexing. The footsteps flapped to a stop outside. The seekers demand right of entry. The goblins began to bang on the door, then stopped in surprise as it swung open. This place is empty, said one. Let's move on. You got no imagination, Grum, said the other. Here's our chance to pick up a few pieces of silver. A goblin's head appeared around the open door. Its eyes focused on Raceland, sitting calmly, his staff on his shoulder. The goblin grunted in alarm, then began to laugh. Oh ho, look what we found, a staff! The goblin's eyes gleamed. It took a, a step toward Raceland, its partner crowding close behind. Hand me that staff. Certainly, the mage whispered. He held his own staff forth. Shirak, he said. The crystal ball flared into light. The goblins shrieked and shut their eyes, fumbling from their swords. At that moment, Caraman jumped from behind the door, grabbed the goblins around their necks, and swept their heads together in a sickening thud. The goblins' bodies crumpled into a stinking heap. 
Dead? asked Tannis as Carmen bent over them, examining them by the light of Raceland's staff. I'm afraid so, the big man sighed. I hit them too hard. Well, that's torn it, Tannis said grimly. We've murdered two more of the Theocrat's guards. He'll have the town up in arms. Now we can't just lie low for a few days. We've got to get out of here. And you two, he turned to the barbarians, had better come with us. Wherever we're going, muttered Flint irritably. Where were you headed, Tannis asked Riverwind. We were traveling to Haven, the barbarian answered reluctantly. There are wise men there, Goldmoon said. We hope they could tell us about this staff. You see, the song I sang, it was true. The staff saved our lives. You'll have to tell us later, Tannis interrupted. When these guards don't report back, every goblin in Solace will be swarming up the trees. Raceland, put, put out that light. The mage spoke another word, Dumak. The crystal glimmered, then the light died. What do we do with the bodies, Karaman asked, nudging a dead goblin with his booted foot. And what about Tika? Won't she get into trouble? Leave the bodies. Tannis' mind was working quickly. And hack up the door. Sturm, knock over a few tables. We'll make it look like we broke in here and got into a fight with these fellows. That way, Tika shouldn't be able be in too much trouble. She's a smart girl. She'll manage. We'll need food, Tasseloff stated. He ran into the kitchen and began rummaging through the shelves, stuffing loaves of bread and anything that looked edible into his pouches. He tossed Flynn a full skin of wine. Sturm overturned a few chairs. Kyraman arranged the bodies to make it look as they had died in a ferocious battle. The plainsmen stood in front of the dying fire, looking at Tannis uncertainly. Well, said Sturm, now what? Where are we going? Tannis hesitated, running over the options in his mind. The plainsmen had come from the east, and, if their story was true and their tribe had been trying to kill them, they wouldn't want to go back that way. The group could travel south into the Elven Kingdom, but Tennis felt a strange reluctance to go back to his homelands. He knew, too, that the elves would not be pleased to see these strangers enter their hidden city. We will travel north, he said finally. We will escort these two until we come to the crossroads, then we can decide what to do from there. They can go on southwest to Haven if they wish. I plan to travel farther north and see if the rumors about armies gathering are true. And perhaps run into Kitiara, Raceland whispered slyly. Tannis flushed. Is that plan all right? He asked, looking around. Though, <clears throat> though not the eldest among us, Tannis, you are the wisest, Sturm said. We follow you, as always. Kerman nodded. Raceland was already heading for the door. Flint shouldered the wineskin, grumbling. Tannis felt a gentle hand touch his arm. He turned and looked down into the clear blue eyes of the beautiful barbarian. We are grateful, Goldmoon said slowly, as if unused to expressing appreciation. You risk your lives for us, and we are strangers. Tannis smiled and clasped her hand. I am Tannis. The brothers are Carmen and Raceland. The knight is Sturm Brightblade. Flint Fireforge carries the wine, and Tasselhoof Burfoot is our clever locksmith. You are Goldmoon, and he is Riverwind. There, we are strangers no longer. Goldmoon smiled wearily. She patted Tannis' arm, then started out the door, leaning on the staff that once again seemed plain and nondescript. Tannis watched her, then glanced up to see Riverwind staring at him, the barbarian's dark face and impenetrable mask. Well, Tannis amended slightly, some of us are no longer strangers. Soon everyone had gone, Taz leading the way. Tannis stood alone for a moment in the wrecked living room, staring at the bodies of the goblins. This was supposed to have been a peaceful homecoming after bitter years of solitary travel. He thought of his comfortable house. He thought of all the things he had planned to do, things he had planned to do together with Kitiara. He thought of long winter nights with storytelling around the fire at the inn, then returning home laughing together beneath the fur blankets, sleeping through the snow-covered mornings. Tannis kicked at the smoldering coals, scattered them. Kitiara had not come back. Goblins had invaded his quiet town, he was fleeing into the night in, to escape a bunch of religious fanatics, with every likelihood he could never return. Elves do not notice the passage of time. They live for hundreds of years. For them, the seasons pass like brief rain showers. But Tannis was half-human. He sensed change coming, felt the disquieting restlessness men feel before a thunderstorm. He sighed and shook his head. Then he went out the shattered door, leaving it swinging crazily on one hinge.